most of us, if not all of us, were never taught what we need to know to avoid being taken advantage of by a bank. And over the last eight years, we've put together a program we call The Method. And The Method is a different way of doing your day-to-day -day banking. I started a company called Magnetic Mortgages and Investing. Magnetic is synonymous for attraction. We believe in the law of attraction. We believe that if we just give people something of value, then the rest will take care of itself. So I have no idea what's going to happen after tonight, but I know I'm able to meet about 10 or 12 new people tonight that don't know about us. How many are familiar with our company? Right? Okay, so you don't know about us. I don't know about you, for the most part. So I'm going to give you something today that I think will serve you the rest of your life. It should save you a lot of time and a lot of money. For me, time and money are my two biggest assets. You agree? Okay. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, uh, I was taught to bank with a checking account and a savings account. It's all of you. It's all I've ever been taught. I was taught by somebody I trust implicitly. I call him my father. And I just listened to what he did all his life. When I got to uh, about 32 years old and I started into this business, I realized I didn't know a lot. And here I was, licensed to, uh, to broker mortgages, and I didn't really know enough about how to get people out of the mortgage. I only knew how to get them into a mortgage, which to me was just one big debt. And so instead of focusing where I think most brokers focus, which is helping people get the lowest rate or whatnot, yeah, we do all that. Everybody can. If you have a license, you can do all that. But we spend more of our time focusing on how to get people out of debt and build wealth. So what I'm about to show you is how the average two-income earning family can build equity in their home at four to five times the normal pace without any extra money. That's uh, maybe sound too good to be true to you right now, but really it's just mathematics. And if you were never taught, I mean, I went through 20 years of school, nobody ever taught me how to manage a mortgage, and for most of it, it's our largest liability. And so if you were never taught like I was never taught, then hopefully you get something out of this. Now, I think it requires a little bit of explanation where I'm coming from and uh, how I ended up here. I, I promise you this, when they asked me when I was a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up, I never said mortgage broker. It, was, it, wasn't, it was the furthest thing from my mind. I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. That dream died at 21, and uh, I'm now 39 years old. I'm married, I have a two and a half year old daughter. Uh, my wife works in the business with me. I, I run the brokerage, I've had the brokerage for eight years. We're a, a company of four employees, we're very strong. We do about $50 million of residential funding every year. We also lend out about $10 million worth of private funds each year from people just like you, people who have RSP money and it's not doing well in stocks and they want you know, a little bit uh, better returns with less volatility and so on. They lend in mortgages. We can talk about that uh, towards the end of tonight. But when I got in the business, it was um, the culmination of a series of events in my life that led me to want to start my own business in an area I knew nothing about. That sounds strange, but I'll tell you why or how it came to be. All my life I've always known that I wanted to do exactly what I'm doing tonight. This is why the platform that I've chosen is speaking. I enjoy it. I love being in front of an audience. I've been in front of an audience all my whole life. I just wasn't doing the right thing on a stage for most of my life. I tried singing, dancing, you name it, I did it all. It wasn't, it wasn't all for me, but this was for me. And I always knew this was for me. I just didn't know how to exercise the skill. So in my 20s, I remember having a conversation with a very close friend and he was, uh, he's been into cars his whole life, so he's in car marketing, and his career was taken off. I'm in my mid-20s, and I'm thinking, I'm still working at a fine dining restaurant uh, as a waiter, because that allowed me to exercise my skill on a nightly basis. I could tell people what to eat. You know, I could come and do a great little presentation at a table. I felt good about what I was doing, but I knew it wasn't a long-term path. Well, in uh, 1999, I took a job. I wanted to run away from life. I think some people in the room may know what that's like. I was 24 years old. I wanted to run away. So what I did is I got a job working on a cruise line for Disney. And I was a bartender on the cruise line. But that uh, experience was one I'll never, ever forget. In fact, I owe Disney a lot. Because uh, Disney, Walt Disney once, uh, he, he said, he said that magic is taking something that's perceived to be impossible and make it possible. That's what he said. And when I went down there, like everybody else, I thought, you know, you know, it's, it's hokey, it's Disney, right? But then I saw it come to life. You know, for a week before I started my job, I had to go to Disney University, which was essentially one week learning the names of every candlestick, character, <laughs> broomstick, you name it, uh, ever to be uh, created by Disney. 
so that I could sign a contract on the last day of the training that I promised to uphold the magic and protect the magic of Disney. That was, that was uh, a big deal, but I, again, thought that was kind of hokey. When I got on the ship, I'll share one story with you that brought it all to life for me. It was New Year's Eve on the millennium. You remember 1999, New Year's Eve? You remember the climate of the world at that time? Yeah. Everybody thought the world was going to end that night. The safest place you could be was out in the middle of the ocean where I was, and there was two ships, side by side, Disney style, firing uh, fireworks back and forth the whole night. It was unbelievable. All my job the whole night was just to pour table and table after table of champagne. That's all I did all night, popping corks into the ocean. It was phenomenal. But at 5, 6 in the morning when I left the deck, the deck was as Disney, un-Disney-like as you can imagine. So Disney's famous for being the cleanest public place on the planet. You've been to Disney World? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, they did a study once in Disney World to find out how long somebody would carry a piece of garbage in their hand before they throw it on the ground. They found it was 12 feet. And so in every direction, wherever you are, look around the next time you're in Disney World, you see a garbage can every 12 to 14 feet. It's unbelievable. They'll spare no expense to create this experience for people. I was on the deck the next morning, New Year's uh, morning. I come up. It's, I've only been sleeping for two, three hours. I come up, the place is immaculate. I mean, I'm telling you, when people think the world is going to end, you can imagine what they were doing the night before <laughs> on that deck. 4,000 people, okay? It's a deck 300 yards wide, I mean long by 100 yards wide. It's, it's just, have you been on the Disney ship? Anybody been on the Disney ship? It's unbelievable. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. It's crazy. So when we got up there that morning, it was impeccable. Okay, it was like a army of Disney elves had come out for two and a half hours and just made it brand new. Now you're smiling like you know what I'm talking about, like you had some sort of experience like this on the ship. Well, this is what I witnessed. I witnessed an officer, guys with the stripes on their shoulders, talking with a kid my age, 39, I mean uh, an adult my age, 39, 40 years old, with a maybe a five-year-old son with him. And they're, they're talking and the adult says to the officer, he says, hey, uh, listen, I was, I was down here, I was up here like three hours ago. And this place was a complete mess. You come up here, it's, it's brilliant. Like, how do you guys do it? And the officer looks him square in the eyes and he goes, Sir, it's magic. From the Disney ship. And the son's like, Yeah, Dad, it's magic. Right? So you imagine the impact that that has on you when you see that many people. What it shows you is that when the right people come together, unattached to who gets the credit, anything's possible. So I took that away from my Disney experience. When I came back, I got a job, and the job was working for a company called Richard Robbins International, which was uh, still today the leading real estate <laughs> training company in the country. My job was to go from office to office, facilitating a workshop. It was one hour long. It was called Plan, Produce, and Profit. And it was all about teaching agents how to be better entrepreneurs. Okay, and so I would facilitate this one hour workshop. It was like a teaser, and at the end I'd ask them to take $800 out of their pocket and buy a ticket to come to a three-day event similar to the one I was putting on, hosted by the CEO, okay? And in nine months in that job, I became the leading salesperson in the company, and I never felt like I was selling anything. I just felt like I was in my glory. I was teaching this great workshop that I really believed in, and what it taught was the principles of success. So how to be successful in business. Things like giving starts the receiving process. As hokey as it sounds, 100% true, okay? Like I just said to you, when the right people come together, unattached to who gets the credit, Anything's possible. So you start to learn things like this. You know, 90% of people shop for value. 10% of people shop for price. They're cheap. We have cheap friends. That's what they do, right? But we shouldn't cater to the 10. We should cater to the 90. Bring value to what you're doing. Teach people something that makes a positive and significant impact on their time and their money and you get their attention. It gets my attention when someone makes a positive impact on my time or my money. So all these things are swirling in my head and I decide, you know what, I'd rather be them running a business based on these principles that it would be me teaching them how to do it. Make sense? Yeah. So, I picked, so I picked a business I knew nothing about. And the reason I did that was because the business was never meant to be the end goal. The business was supposed to be a shining example of if I could start a business you know, in an area I knew nothing about based solely on these principles I'd learned from Disney and from Rich, then I could spend the rest of my life teaching other people how to do it from a stage. So that's why we're here tonight. The thing is, it's taken on a life of its own. I'm now eight years into it. The business is very successful. It's all because of what I'm about to show you today. This is the anchor of, of all of that, the culmination of all of it. So I learned how to help uh, people pay their mortgages off in half the time using the same money. I want to show you how to do that tonight. So over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to show you a concept. Now, the temptation 
is going to be for you to, while I'm doing it, start to t try to tumble numbers in your head for your own situation. I just want to caution you not to do that if you can. Because if you understand the concept when it's done, it's going to be really easy to apply your numbers to it afterwards. Does everybody have a workbook in front of them? Yeah. Okay, so in the workbook, there's a little card, okay? Here's what I don't expect you to do. When you have a question and it involves personal information about your own situation, I certainly don't expect you to put up your hand and divulge your whole life financial story in front of a, a bunch of strangers. So, but, history has shown that afterwards, so a lot of people don't ask questions in this environment, but after the workshop, I have a lineup of people wanting to ask me one burning question. So what we did is we created these books and we put those cards into it. So here's what it says. I, I'm, we're not, we're not uh, like we don't chase people. We try to bring you here. If you get it, you get it. If you want to do business with us or you want to talk to us afterwards, great. All you have to do is let us know. And the way you let us know, it's our communication is that card. So if we make an impact on you tonight, then you just want to fill out the card with your name, phone number, and email address and check off the box according to what you'd like to talk to us about. Continue the conversation and somebody will get back to you right away. We'll set up a one-on-one -on -one opportunity for us to chat and then expand from there. Make sense? Okay. Um, so, everybody have what they need. Bathrooms, if you need them, are late, literally on the other side of this wall. Okay, so if you go out, just turn right, follow the yellow brick road, if you will, right to the bathrooms. Okay, so most people agree or disagree. Bank with a checking account and a savings account as the central hub. By the way, I forgot. Orville got almost everybody here tonight, and this is how we get an audience. So we have partners, real estate partners, and we say to them, hey, if you liked what you saw when we taught you, then why not invite some of your best clients who, if you're in real estate, likely have mortgages and could use the information. And so he did the work of getting people here tonight. So it's a big deal because it's not easy to get people anywhere on a Tuesday night uh, to share their time, especially for a seminar, because how many times you've been to a seminar and they want you to join a business? Right? We don't need any new business partners, so you're good. Or they want you to buy something. We don't have anything to sell you. So uh, really good on Orville to get you guys here tonight, and uh, you know, hopefully we deliver. Checking account, savings account, here's how it works. Tell me if you agree. Income goes into the checking account, expenses come out, and whatever's left over goes into some sort of savings vehicle. That's it. That's what we were taught. I mean, it doesn't get much more complicated than that. That's typically what most people do. Yes or no? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I asked you why you do it this way, what would you say? It's the easiest. It's the easiest. Fair answer. Anybody else? Why do we do it? Like, typically we do things, especially when they have to do with money, we do it because there's something in it for us, right? So what's in it for you to bank this way? And, and certainly I'm not judging you for not knowing because this is where I was. When I got to the place in the business where I was like, Listen, I gotta try and figure out a way to help people get out. I started looking at this, I was like, well, so why do I do it this way? So all the questions I'm asking you are questions I ask myself. We had a funny chat a few minutes ago. I said, you know, the hardest thing about what I'm teaching people was learning how to teach it. I know how to do it, but learning how to teach it took two years. Why do you do it? What value is in there for us? Okay, let's switch the question. Is there any value in here for the bank? Lots. Yeah. Lots. Yeah. 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 Lots. Okay. The value in the bank is this. If you put money in a checking account, do the, does the bank have access to your money? Yes or no? Can they leverage the money? Is that legal? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Do you get anything for it? No. Anybody have a 1%, 2% interest rate on their checking account? <laughs> right? Zero, right? No value here. And in a savings account, I mean, it's unbelievable. You'll see ads on television, and it's like they're cheery to try and tell you that you're going to get one and a half or two and a half percent interest, yes? Okay? So you get very little here, almost nothing here, if anything at all. I, I don't know of a checking account yet that pays anybody anything. In fact, every checking account charges you to use your money. Right? While they're using your money too. And here's and I'm gonna oversimplify the banking system for you, but it's this is how it works. You buy a GIC, you get a guaranteed two percent interest, they take the GIC money, they lend it back to you for your mortgage, or a line of credit, or credit card. Same thing with checking account money, savings account money. They leverage it, they're allowed to lend against it up to ten times what you put in the bank. So they only have to hold one tenth 
of the money that they're lending out, okay, as long as it's securitized by something. So amazing little system, right? But the deal is they'll keep your money safe, which they know you value, security. Instead of keeping it at your house, you get to keep it at the bank, okay, and it's insured. Right? And it's convenient, right? They give you a debit card, you can use it anywhere you need to, right? So convenience and security cost us a lot. And it's a really important thing for you to understand. What about these three accounts? Can we all agree? They're all borrowing vehicles. That's what we've been taught. We've been taught that when you get a line of credit, it's to get something you couldn't get now with your own money, so you borrow to get it. And the credit card's the same, and a mortgage is the same. What I want to show you is that you could abandon this, and you could just use these three accounts, all of which are the bank's money, and flip the whole systems on, on its back. So instead of them leveraging your money, you could leverage their money, and the result would be that you would be out of debt a lot faster. Okay, and remember, a mortgage is designed to keep you in debt forever. 25, 30 years, right? When I was growing up, that's all I knew. So somebody said, how long does it take to pay a mortgage off? It's 25 years. That's what I learned. It's the only thing I learned about a mortgage, okay? It doesn't take that long, but most people don't know how to manage one. So if you don't know how to manage one, it gets away from you very quickly. And the reason is really simple. It's because of the effect of compounded interest and the effect that it's such a long-term debt. It's such a big amount of money. You can't pay it off fast. And when we can't do something fast in this world, we tend to fall off the wagon or give up. Just ask me. I go to the gym January 1st, right? And I'm all hyped to do it. And two weeks later, uh, my membership is done for the year, right? It's like, and then maybe three months later, when I'm when I'm particularly full and I'm not feeling very good, I get I get the urge to go back to the gym, right? I'm, I I feel sorry for myself and I want to do it again. But these are some of the things that happen in life. It's it's normal, instant gratification world. So what I'm going to show you is how to leverage these three accounts, give up these two accounts, and make a significant impact on your uh, financial picture. Okay, just so that you have enough motivation that you know I didn't call you here tonight to save you $1,000, I'm going to show you the numbers. The average mortgage in the GTA is $220,000. The most common amortization is 30 years, okay? The average five-year fixed rate over the last 10 years is 5.15. I don't use today's rates because they're atypical. It would make the numbers really look good, but they're atypical. We're going to go back here at some point in the next five to 10 years, okay? And uh, over 30 years, 220 at 5.15. Any guesses how much interest this mortgage is going to accrue? 200, 190? 190, 200. Any other guesses? It's 210,000, okay? So over 30 years, you're going to buy one house and pay for two. That's not good for you, certainly not good for him, right? It's not good for anybody. Okay? Well, we don't want to be buying one house and paying for two. We want to be building equity as fast as possible. It doesn't work this way. You need to know that. If you didn't know that answer, then you have no urgency. What if I told you that it was possible on the same money to chop that down to 12 and a half years and take this from 210 to 76,000 for a savings of over $1,000 tax-free money each year for 12 and a half years. Uh, sorry, each month for 12 and a half years. What family couldn't use $1,000 tax-free money back in their pocket each month for 12 years? That's a lot of desserts, a lot of food. <laughs> Everybody gets a doggy bag on the way out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Discuss with your partner how you're gonna share the food on your table. <laughs> 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 you want another iced tea? No. So, in order for us to understand the system I'm going to show you, you have to understand each part and how it actually functions. So here's what I'm going to show you. First, I want to talk about the mortgage. A couple things you may or may not know about a mortgage. Number one, charges interest every day. The mortgage I just showed you will charge almost $35 a day in interest. Okay, It's more money than it would cost to feed some families of four in a day. But the problem is you don't see it. It's never pointed out to you, it's never in your face, it's silent. You know, if they really wanted to remedy this problem, what would happen is every time you use your debit card, a little message would come and said, your mortgage is charging 30 bucks in interest, right? It would change the way, right? If we had a mirror to show it to us every day and you were conscious of it, it might change the way you behave treating the mortgage, but we forget about it. Not only is it daily interest, but it compounds 
twice a year. Mm -hmm. Now we shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves because of the difference between simple and compounded interest. Mm -hmm. And let me qualify, enough that you can come up and teach everybody else, right? If you don't know, you need to know. I'm gonna teach you exactly how it works. Let's say uh, a limb, uh, let's say a limb needs to borrow a dollar. This is how compounded interest works. You need to borrow a dollar, you come to me, I have a dollar to lend you. So I make the rules, right? Because it's my money. So the rules are this. I'll give you the dollar, you have a year to pay me back, you owe me 100% interest. How much interest are you going to pay back? A dollar. Right. So a dollar plus a dollar equals two dollars. This is simple interest because it's simple, right? That's why. Compounded is something different. That's when a limb says, wait a minute, I don't really need to uh, a year to pay you back. Is there something we could do here? I'm going to say, well, here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to change the interest rate. It's going to stay at 100%. But I will give you a shot to pay me back early and so save some of the 100%. So we'll split the loan into two halves. The first half will be six months and the second half will be six months. In the first six months, at the end of it, you'll owe me a dollar plus 50% of the 100%. So you'll owe me a dollar fifty. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yep. If a limb comes to me on the day that he's due to pay me and he says, Chris, something happened, I only have a dollar forty-five, you know, is that okay? They say, no, it's not okay, because I have no emotion when I lend money. So uh, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, you keep your dollar forty-five, and now we have a new <coughs> loan starting with a balance of a dollar fifty that's gonna accrue the other fifty percent interest for the next six months. You're gonna pay me seventy-five cents on that. And now you're going to pay me back $2.25. You with me? Yes. Is a one year at 100% the same thing as six months at 50% and six months at 50%? Well, the term didn't change. It's still a one year term. I'm just giving you the opportunity to pay me back in full at the halfway point and pay me all interest that's accrued to date. That said, if you accept those terms, right, in return, if you don't pay me everything, then we start the new six months with a new balance. So we actually apply the 50% interest and then start a new loan for six months mm -hmm. with another 50%. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. The interest rate didn't change. Yeah. The term did. didn't change. Yeah. The terms changed. Okay, you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is on one dollar over one year. Imagine on 220, 220,000 over 25 years, mm -hmm. every six months. You can't pay your mortgage off in six months. So that, that interest accrues and then you charge interest on interest. It's all pre-calculated, so you don't actually see it. It's just you get your payment, that's what you know. But the payment is amortized over the length of time, including all the compounding, okay? So in order to manage a mortgage, we need to take uh, a preemptive strike approach, so to speak. We have to take an Eastern medicine approach to paying a mortgage off. If you, if you take the Western medicine approach, which is once the interest is there, then we try to deal with it, it's too late, you gotta pay it off. If you take the Eastern medicine approach, which would be preventative, prevent the interest from getting there in the first place, it's your only hope. And that's what we're gonna do in the system we're gonna show you, but you needed to understand these two elements that make the mortgage what we call the serial killer of debt. It doesn't care about <laughs> you, it doesn't care if you lose your job, it doesn't care if you have six kids, it doesn't care how your circumstances change. Once the meter starts running, it doesn't stop. So if you're not running the meter or controlling the meter, it just keeps running and running and running. This is where people get on the cycle of, I build a little equity, it's not going fast enough, I refinance, take it out, go back up. So uh, I know a perfect example, I have a client, it's unfortunate, but they bought a house worth 275,000 15 years ago. They have a mortgage of 400,000 today. Oh. Okay? So that happens because you don't really understand how to manage the mortgage. You're not paying attention to what you're being taught or if or you're not being taught at all, right? So the house is worth more. The house is worth almost 600,000 now, but imagine you you have you have a bigger mortgage today 15 years later than you did when you started or what you paid for the house, okay? So that's the mortgage. It's the most aggressive, it's the target, okay? So we're gonna put a target on it. It's the one we're gonna gear everything towards. The other two accounts we're gonna to use to help us kill the mortgage, okay? The credit card, it's really simple. It's like the uh, little cousin of the mortgage, okay? The difference is, two differences. Number one, it's daily interest, so it's the same. Number two, uh, it's compounded. 12 times a year, every month. So if you carry a balance on your credit card, really damaging, compounds every month. Uh, but there are two things about a, a credit card 
that make it really friendly. Two things we really like about our credit cards. Okay? Anybody any guesses what they are? <laughs> okay, that's 30, 30 three, days interest three, three things. Three things. Jeff making a really good end of the presentation. Three, three, <laughs> three things that are really nice about the mortgage. Yes, lower balances for sure. 30 things days interest there. free. 30 to 45 days interest free. This is great. Okay, so if you were thinking strategically, you would be able to lend yourself money on your credit card at 34, 30 to 45 days with no interest. That's very good. What's the other thing? What do all credit card companies offer us in order to compete for our business? Points. Yes, points. Okay. So if I run up the balance of my credit card and pay it off every month, I just get points. I never pay interest. This is a good way to manage the credit card, right? Okay. So we need to remember these two things, and we need to get away from these two things. Never want to carry a balance on a credit card. The line of credit. This is usually the eye opener for people. The line of credit is, I would call it your best friend in the banking industry. The reason I call it the best friend is because it's the least aggressive interest bearing account and it functions, <coughs> this is key, it functions exactly like your checking account. All the functionality you have in your checking account you can have in your line of credit. The only difference is your checking account is your money and the line of credit is the bank's money. Line of credit is easy to get, not a high balance but a reasonable one, five, ten thousand dollars uh, credit limit. It's very easy to get. If you, have, if you can't get it, you probably have a different problem and it probably has to do with your bureau, right? Your credit record. But if you can get one, it's awesome. Here's why. Number one, simple interest. Very different. Now, I have to clarify, we're not talking about a home equity line of credit. We're not talking about a home equity line of credit, like one that's secured on your house. Those function like a credit card, okay? Compound 12 times a year, so on. They're worse than a mortgage, believe it or not. They're only good for you if you're managing them for a specific reason. We can talk about that later. We're talking about a personal line of credit, unsecured, okay? PLC. PLOC, yes, okay? Personal line of credit, unsecured being the key. It's like a credit card. There's no security. If you, you know, you don't pay, it goes to collections and they just come after you, okay? But they have no, uh, no security. Number two, it charges interest in a different way. It charges interest based on the average daily balance at the end of each month. Now that may not mean anything to you, but it is huge for what I'm about to show you. The average daily balance means, okay, this should illustrate it for you. If my balance starts here and ends here, but I do this with it, I pay interest somewhere here. If I do this with the balance throughout the month, I pay interest somewhere here. Does it make sense? Okay. So you can start high, end high, and pay interest on a different balance if you manage your daily balance strategically. And I'm going to show you how to do that with relative ease. Okay? There's not, not a lot. It's not complicated. It's just a bunch of new kind of concepts, new ways to approach. It's like a paradigm shift. I never thought of using my, credit, my line of credit strategically. I always just borrowed and paid it off when I could. Okay, but it's simple interest charged on the average daily balance makes it a very friendly place to carry debt. Okay, and that's what you need to take away from just this page. I'm going to put all three accounts together and I'm going to show you a real life example using numbers from Statistics Canada that um, illustrate the typical scenario of a two income earning family in Canada. By putting numbers to it and a real scenario, it should bring it all to life for you. Okay, this is where the temptation comes and will start to come to put your own numbers into it. Try to resist. Okay, three buckets. We got the mortgage, we got the line of credit, and we got the credit card. Envision this is your new hub of day-to-day -day banking, and the idea here is that we're going to have a mortgage, and we're going to try to beat up the mortgage. We're going to try to get the equity built in the mortgage faster than normal using the bank's money. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to put this at 5.15 percent. I'm going to put the line of credit at 6% for a very specific reason. That may sound high to you, but I'd rather it be high than low, and you'd be sitting there thinking. Oh yeah, well, easy for him to say, who gets a line of credit at 3% or 4%? 6% anybody can get that line of credit, okay, prime plus 3. And a credit card, let's put it at 19.99%, okay? So now that we've got that set up, let's enter our two income earning family, who Statistics Canada says earns $6,000 a month and spends $5,000 a month, leaving discretionary income 
of $1,000 a month. Now, you can do whatever you want with your discretionary income. You can pay down your mortgage. A lot of people come into the office when they get a mortgage and always say, so how are you going to pay the mortgage back in a reasonable period of time? They say, i got a great plan. I'm going to save, 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 and I'm going to make lump sum payments. You ever heard that before? Anybody ever been on the lump sum payment train, right? So people say this all the time, but it doesn't actually happen. That's why we currently spend $1.64 for every dollar earned in Canada, okay? We're seventh in the world, we're getting close to number one. We're seventh in the world for that, okay? We spend more than we earn. Now, $1,000 discretionary income, when people tell me these are their numbers, I always say, well, people tend, agree or disagree, to overestimate what's coming in and underestimate what's going out, agree? Okay. So because they do that, the first thing we do is we subtract 25% from their discretionary income to get what I would call the true discretionary income, which is $750 a month. If you put the $750 away and every three or four months made a lump sum payment to your mortgage, it would be brilliant. And you would, you would get amazing results. But people don't because what typically happens is we go, save, 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 something happens. Use the money don't get it to the mortgage, something comes up and so on. And we go through this cycle of back and forth, trying to save it, not saving it. That's why in years gone by, you could only make your lump sum payments on the anniversary date. I and mean, we remember that day, okay? You used to only be able to do it. Now you can do it any time, but you could only do it on the anniversary. The banks spend millions of dollars knowing who we are. And they knew that most people couldn't make it to the finish line of a year and make that lump sum payment, okay? So with $750 a month, if this, without earning more money or spending less, how much money could this family pay to their mortgage in addition to their payments every year? Think about the, cal the calculation would be 12 months nine grand. times 750, which would be nine grand. Okay, everybody get that? Okay, so $9,000, that's the expectation. A lot of people come to the office and say, hey, uh, I, my friend told me to ask you not only for the best rate, but for the biggest prepayment privilege possible, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this thing hard. And we look at their numbers and we say, well, if you want 20% prepayment privilege on a $220,000 mortgage, that's over $40,000 a year, but without making more money or spending less, you can only do $9,000. It doesn't make sense. So you have to set the expectation. You're going to have to do the same thing. Set the expectation with what's really happening in your life. Okay, once we set that expectation, you need to understand that a mortgage is like a set of stairs. 360 steps equals monthly payments in a 30-year amortization. Your goal is to get up the steps as fast as possible. Now, if you go step by step, okay, each month making a payment, you're gonna pay an interest component and a principal component of every payment that you make. You with me? Okay. In month one, remember the payment here is $1,193.89. That's the mortgage I showed you earlier. $220,000 over 30 years at 5.15% interest yields a monthly payment of $1,193.89. In month one, it's important you know, $934 goes to interest, okay? The interest is calculated first, and then you subtract your payment, and you get a principal contribution of $260 odd dollars, okay? In month two, $933 roughly goes to interest. In month three, we'll take a guess. 31. You guys are great with patterns. Okay. okay, so you see the pattern. It would take 17 and a half years before 50% of your payment will go to principal and 50% will go to interest, okay? Now, granted that we all agree we live in an instant gratification world, you can imagine what this does to the mentality of the borrower. You know, they go a little ways, right? They, they look at their statement, they say, man, I've paid in a lot of money and I don't have anything to show for it. Then the tax return comes and they know they should put it to the market. <coughs> Instead, they take a vacation because what's the point? I'm not getting anywhere with this thing anyways. I'm just going to be in debt for life. And as soon as you resign yourself to being in debt for life, you are in debt for life. And you know what? It's similar to Italian. And the, the best illustration I can give you is it's similar to gambling with a bookie who belongs to the mafia and losing and not being able to pay by Thursday. Right? And so what the guy put his arm around you and he'll say, it's okay, you don't need to pay us back the $10,000 by Thursday. You just need to pay us the interest, right? Which is 20%, right? So you gotta pay us 2,000 by Thursday, and then 2,000 next Thursday, and then 2,000 the Thursday after that. And you see how it gets out of hand. So the point is, is if we manage it this way, it's just gonna mentally drain you. And that's what happens to a lot of Canadians. Now, there's a better way. And I wanna show you exactly what that is. 
So this family, I'm going to tell them, listen, if you want to get these results, you've got to follow my instructions for one year. If you don't like the results after one year, you never have to talk to me again. But I guarantee you this, no matter what happens in this one year, you will be in a better position than you were or you would have been without us. And here's why. First thing I ask you to do is take $9,000 from your line of credit and pay it to your mortgage. You started with $220,000, that's going to drop the balance to two hundred eleven. dollars You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Agree or disagree, we have the same debt as we had five seconds ago. Yeah. Okay, all we did was move $9,000, which is the amount we could reasonably pay back inside of one year from the most aggressive account we have to the least aggressive account we have. Yes? Okay. What that does for you, we have a new problem here. We're going to focus on that in a minute. Okay, so don't worry. I just want to show you what just happened here. It would have taken 33 monthly payments of $1,193.89 to get your mortgage to a balance of $211,000, which you just did in one fell swoop. With me? Okay. By doing that, what you did was skipped or canceled 32 regular payments and prevented the interest that would have come in those months that you skipped from ever getting to your mortgage in the first place. Right. You canceled all these. Each of those 32 payments is around $900, as you can see, you, right? Sorry, you're talking about the table, the, 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 the amortization table that goes yeah. on, that shows you the whole thing, and you're yeah. saying that we just jumped. That's what this is. It's a glimpse of your amortization table, okay? Yeah, okay. What you've done is skipped 32 payments, and you're now at month 33. So if you had just been okay. making regular payments, you'd be at month 33. But you did it in one fell swoop, and in so doing, you eliminated or canceled the interest component of all this, the steps you skipped. All those add up in this case. You'll have to trust my math because I've done this presentation about 3,000 times. $29,000. Okay? The $29,000, if you never did anything else, if you just said, Chris, thanks a lot, and out the door you go, the $29,000 comes off the 210, and it'll never get there again. So now, if you never did anything else, the maximum interest you would pay on this mortgage would be $181,000, and it would cut almost four years off your amortization. That's amazing, right? Because I'm in, I'm in the business of investing. I invest in mortgages. We do very well. It's consistent money. It's predictable money. It's fixed rates and so on. I still can't make three times my money overnight. I can't take $9,000 and turn it into $29,000. This doesn't happen. If you know a way, we need to talk afterwards. Okay? So, so this is phenomenal. But again, we have a new problem, right? Okay? So it's not all, it's not all glamour. We still have this issue. It's not like we, we don't have to pay that back. We do. Now I'm going to show you the one change you need to make to your day-to-day -day banking from checking account savings account to this, okay? The move I just showed you, once a year. You only have to do it once a year. It's, it's simple. It's a transfer online. It's easy. Now you're managing this account instead of a checking account. I'm going to show you how to do it. It's the easiest thing in the world. Let's imagine you're this family and you're making this money bi-weekly. So you're making 3000 now and 3000 in two weeks and 3000 in another two weeks. What will happen is I want you to take that money, instead of putting it in your checking account, put it in the line of credit. Okay? So the $3,000 comes in and it drops the balance to $6,000. Now let's imagine just for a moment that you don't have any expenses because that will just complicate things right now. We'll bring the expenses in in a minute. Two weeks later you're going to get another $3,000. And that's going to drop the balance down to 3000 If I lose anybody, you've got to tell me, okay? So I'm just going to assume you're with me. Now you're at 3000 You sat at 6000 for two weeks. You sit at 3000 for two weeks. You started at 9000 right? And this um, account charges interest on the average daily balance at the end of the month. So it matters that you're sitting at 6 for two weeks and 3 for two weeks. Okay, but now you've got these expenses. Let's just imagine, because it's it's fairly plausible. Almost all of our expenses now can be paid on credit card. The only thing that can't really is a mortgage payment. Gas, food, entertainment, all of it. Online shopping, you name it. It can be done on your credit the card. The utilities can't. Uh, the gas and, and, yeah. and Fair. hydro can't. Let's agree 80% of your expenses can be paid on a credit card. 
but for the purposes of keeping the page really clean, let's just imagine it's 100, yep. okay? And I put $5,000 throughout the month on my credit card. At the end of the month, on the last day, I'm gonna use my line of credit to pay <coughs> off my credit card. I'm gonna have zero balance here, I meaning I pay no interest, but I'm gonna get all the points. Eight, or around eight. The buffer puts us at 82.50. With me? Yeah. Okay, so you started at nine, you ended at eight, 28, 29 days of the year of the month, you're at six or three. You're gonna pay interest around the $4,500 mark. Simple interest, nine times 4,500, it's gonna be about $35 a month, okay? So you're gonna pay $35 a month to save 29,000 this year, okay? Deal? Mm -hmm. You take the deal, yeah? yeah? Twice on Sundays, mm -hmm. right? All the time. It gets better, and I didn't know this part when I first started teaching the system. It came to me a little bit later. But if you go back to this amortization schedule, what you notice, what I showed you earlier was that every month, one more dollar was going to principal, less to interest, right? Mm -hmm. Of your regular payment. Well, if you skip 33 payments, your next regular mortgage payment gets about 33 $34 more to principal, less to interest. You with me? Mm -hmm. So that's your second win. In addition to the $29,000, what we found out by running this with a thousand different scenarios is that in almost every scenario, the additional principal contribution that you get on your next regular mortgage payment is on or about the same as you'd pay in interest on the line of credit to run the whole thing and cancel each other out. Say it, can you say that again slower, please? So, every, so because we skipped 33 months, the next regular payment you make on your mortgage more of the money is going to go to uh, principal, less to interest. Mm -hmm. In almost every case, when running this system, it's about the same amount as the interest charge on the line of credit, oh. 35 bucks. In this case, 34. So, that, so you're saying that roughly that 35 you end up in paying, yeah. that you wouldn't have had to pay, that you're now paying on your PLC, is being offset by the increase in the amount that's going towards principal on the mortgage. Yeah. So net, 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 you're left with this. Yes. But, but haven't, haven't you made tomorrow's problems today by having an $8,000 balance on your line of credit? It's a great question. It's a great question. I don't love the way it was phrased because I think it's confused, but I think I know what you're asking. So I'm going to try to rephrase it. So what you're saying is, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, now I've got this problem that I didn't have yesterday that I have to deal with on a regular basis. Okay. You do have a new problem, but it's being dealt with just in your day-to-day. -day, uh, it's not your money. You use the bank to pay the bank, and you're paying the bank back at a pace, right? So over the, over the course of the year, because you earn more money than you spend, by the way, that's paramount to the whole thing. If you earn less money than you spend, you have a different problem, God can't help you. You have to fix the problem. But if you're making more money than you spend, then this is coming down. What you've done is switch save, 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 pay, because you were using your own money, to pay using the bank's money first, and reduce, reduce, reduce throughout the year organically. Because my income comes in, my expenses go out, and I come down by about 1000 If you do that throughout the year, by 12 months, you should be at zero. In fact, in our example, you should be at zero in nine months. So you have a buffer of nine to 12 months. Now, but you raise a really great question because you can't fail. This system is just, you have to understand, it is better than checking account, savings account. Unequivocally better, right? You can speed up as life uh, deals you windfalls and you can slow down as you hit pitfalls. But you will always be in a better position this way than if you were doing it the way most people are currently doing it, okay? Because it's just more efficient to use other people's money, which is what the whole banking system is founded on, than use your own. Okay, so some people, so let me bring that in perspective. People say all the time, they ask me, what happens if I lose my job right after I borrow the $9,000? Now I can't pay it down. So the question, so this will bring it right to life for you. If I offered you, so, we would call you losing your job, pardon my French, but make it real, shit happens, okay? And when that happens and you're down, the question you'd have to ask yourself is, now that you know everything you know about all these different accounts, would you rather owe 220 here, or 211 here and nine here? 
can't change the fact that you're down. Your life has dropped you uh, a bomb, and it's going to take some time before you can get this. But this is just charging you less interest on this piece than this is. So you're better off no matter what. So this, as soon as you do this, you put yourself in a better position. That make sense? Yeah. OK. But this is a great time to ask questions. So whatever is in your mind. Well, just to point out, Chris, to the <coughs> fact that you're using your slush fund there. Yeah. Uh, you got the 9,000 instead. Before, we had the psychological problem. You had this big mortgage you couldn't touch. Mm -hmm. Now you've got 9,000 as your focus for the year. Yeah. And that's doable. It's and, it, and it's in your face. Yeah. Like, it's more. It's such know, a great you, point. You, 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 so I would have got to it if you hadn't brought it up. But it's, it's amazing. The mentality of money, the psychology of money is that, yes, so you look at this as a molehill. This is a mountain. So when you get that tax return that I talked about before, and you look at it and go, what's the effect of putting a $4,000 tax return against my line of credit? It's 50% almost. It's a dent. It's a real dent, right? So you feel good about doing it. Um, not only that, if you did it, it's, re it's accessible still. You could grab it back if you needed it, right? So it's, it's really like it, it goes with the ebb and flow of life, right? Which, so it makes it practical. This is not pie in the sky. Nobody can do it. One of the other things um, that, that came up early on in one of these presentations, in fact, when it came up, it, it hurt me because I thought somebody had really poked a hole in this whole thing and I felt badly about it. Someone sat in the audience just like you and uh, the next day when talking in a follow-up, she said to me, Chris, you know, it was really great and I love the presentation, but you know, it's really bittersweet for me. And I said, why? She said, well, because I'm a single mom. I make $100 more than I spend every month. Like, I barely make it. I'm scraping by. And to see that, just made me feel like, you know, I gotta go out and get another job, you know, or something. And so, at first I was like, man, that's bad. Like, that's really bad. I should use better numbers. Like, I should use smaller numbers. So the fact is, that is the average, and so on. But there are these people out there. So I went back and I started calculating, what's the power of 100 bucks? So what if you did it with 100? Right, so if you only had $100 in the system, well, if you only had $100 in the system, believe it or not, it would take a 30-year uh, mortgage and it would turn it into a 23-year mortgage. It would save for seven years and it would save for $56,000 in interest. It turns out the first 100 is the most powerful. The sec Every 100 after that is the law of diminishing returns. There's less to save, so there's less being saved. So I show you these numbers. And with $1,000 in the system, this is really important. If you have $1,000 discretionary money and you use 750 of it, you're, you're done in 12 and a half years at a cost of 76,000. If you only had $100, okay, you're, down, you're done in 23 years and you're paying, uh, what's it, 10 minus 56, it's about 154. Now, Increments in between give you in-between results. The beauty of it is this. You can look at this. With, now, usually we have a projector, and there's a, a table that I can show you of all the different, um, all the different levels. Sorry, what's, what's the 76? I don't mean to interrupt. That's how much interest you would pay. Oh, that's the, the 210 if you do it. This is how many years it would take to pay off if you did the example I just showed you. Yeah. And the interest would be not 210. <coughs> it would be 76,500. Okay. Okay, and if you only had $100 to use in the system, the mortgage would take you 23 years to pay off, not 30. Seven years is pretty good at 100 bucks, and instead of 210, you pay 154. So you could put down there 0, 25, and 210, yeah? And then it goes up like, is that, is that have I got that right? Okay. 210. Okay. Great. Yeah, but for 10 times the investment, you only save half. Yeah. Okay, so that's the. That's the aha, right? Because it gives you context. So once you see this, then you can say, I make $1,000 more than I spend, but you know what? I want to have a good quality of life too. I still want to take a vacation every year. I still want to do this and that. I want to buy a TV, whatever I want to do. And you can say, I'm comfortable with the $500 a month path, which will see me paid off in 17 years, right? And I'm going to pay 100, 100,000, whatever it is. I don't know. We have a table. I don't know it off by heart, but on the, do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. On the screen, you would see the whole table. But you can pick kind of what pace you want to go at. Not only that, you can adjust the pace every year because every year you're deciding how much to transfer from your line of credit to your mortgage. So as things change in life, you know, like I had a kid two and a half years ago, change everything, right? I had to revisit everything, right? So, you know, game changers happen, things happen in life, good and bad, 
and you can go faster or slower as, uh, you know, the world's your oyster. This is just a better, more efficient system <coughs> of banking for the consumer than what we're currently doing and have been doing for years and years. But there's a good reason why banks make 30% profit across the board in 2009. Right. So what's the biggest lever in your system? Is it the mortgage mortgage balance? Is it the interest rate? Is it the term? Is it your line of credit? Interest is it discretionary income? What is the biggest lever in that? The biggest lever is discipline to to do it. A hundred percent of the people who see this love it, like anything else, a small percentage implement. But the beauty of it is you can fall off the wagon a lot of times and get back on. Yeah. Here's your question. Mm -hmm. You know, a few pages back, um, the stat, the stat Canada average uh, cost of living for a family of four, five thousand a month. Mm -hmm. Is that that's like across the country? Average two income earning family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those stats are always changing. Okay. Any so we've I've done a thousand of these kind of different scenarios. What you'll find is it's all relative. Okay, um, but that's why I tell you the last piece, which is you might not be the thousand dollar piece. Those numbers might not be accurate, you know, for this part of the country. They may not be a accurate for a certain um, a certain demographic, you know, a certain cohort, like twenty five to forty four or forty four to fifty five kind of thing. So it's a, an average. It's a tough number, but it is the best number I could use to bring it to life. Yeah. I think the big aha is. Like you said, that first hundred dollars since like building your RSP from you know birth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, your mortgage is the best savings account there is. It'll give you the best return. What do you think about it? It's an investment. To put money into your house is an investment. The nice thing about it too is it's forced discipline because you can't take it back out without paying money to get it back out to refinance it. So once it's in there, it's it's there. Right? Which should also be caused to temper how you set this up because once it's gone, it's gone. So you know, some people run out of here and they're like, oh, I did it the next day, right? You did what? I, I did it. I transferred nine grand to my mortgage. Bill. So I'm so excited, right? It's not the right way to do it. It's a little bit of planning that needs to go into. It's happened before, trust me, it's happened. People get excited. But so, you know, there's work to do to determine what the right number is for you and your family. That's the sharing you need to do with us if you want to do that. You'll fill out that card and let me know, and we'll get that uh, started for you. That's what we do for people. Uh, in addition to doing that for people, we obviously broker mortgages. Uh, but we broker them, as you see, from a different perspective. Anybody can get you the best rate. Anybody, any, anyone with a license who's willing to do the work can get you the best rate. Uh, but there's a lot more to getting a mortgage. You know, I have a theory. Uh, you can agree or disagree, but I think it's impossible for. Um, the bank to have my best interest in mind when it's their money I'm borrowing. So you think about it that way, right? Why should you use a broker instead of a bank for to do your mortgage? Uh, it's just impossible. It's just impossible. If I'm lending my money, I have my best interest in mind. Period. Right? I don't have yours. So to walk into a bank and negotiate your mortgage uh, and take the advice of the bank at the same time, uh, I wouldn't do it in business. I wouldn't do it in real life. That said. There are good brokers, there are bad ones, and there's unfortunately more bad ones than good ones, I think. So you have to also uh, temper it with that, yes? You made a good point that the um, mortgage is your best investment. Mm -hmm. Like to pay it down, it helps yeah. with your best investment. Where is RSP fitting? Okay, so good segue. Um, we should have you come to every one of the presentations <laughs> going forward. The other side of our business is the lending side of the business. And we'll come back, by the way, if you have questions about what we just showed you. The lending side of our business is came about as a result of that question being asked so many times. So when I first started, the first four years of doing this business, all we did was what I just showed you. That's it. It was like, if you learned something and it made an impact on you, then you can say thank you by becoming a client of ours, and we will, we will treat your mortgage the way we would treat our own. So we'll apply all of our knowledge and whatnot and get you a great mortgage. When people started having success with the system, and it, it made a lot of loyalty and advocacy for us. So I started getting phone calls. It would be amazing. People would call like a year later and be like, I was at your seminar a year ago. My mortgage wasn't due then, but it's due now. It's an amazing compliment, right? Like was, someone would hold on to your card that long. And then they'd say in the midst of that conversation, they'd say, by the way, do you do anything with RSPs? Because mine suck. Mm -hmm. Like it, literally, it would be like that. And 
And I'd be like, no, we don't do we don't do RSPs. We're not in the investment game. At that time, the company was called Interest Free Mortgage Center. So we did teach people how to make their mortgage interest free. It happened so many times. We started looking for ways that we could help people with RSPs, and that's what got us into the um, mortgage lending side of the business. It served us really well because sometimes, especially with rules changing nowadays, self-employed people, people are getting divorced or separated. Uh, debt consolidation, sometimes they don't qualify for enough money that they need and they need a little bit of a private mortgage on top of their first mortgage. And now we're capable of doing that. The last four years we put a heavy emphasis on it and you can invest your RSPs in mortgages. Now the beauty of investing your RSPs in mortgages is that they pay fixed returns so you know exactly what you're getting. Anybody own an investment property, like a rental property? Okay, so if you do, then it's like owning a rental property collecting a check every month without any of the headaches of tenants or maintenance or worrying about the property or managing it. That's what it is. You lend your money to somebody and we do it based on a very specific set of criteria. But before I show you the criteria, I'll tell you, we're not smarter than anybody else, but in four years we've lent well over $10 million of clients' money who never lost a dime, never had a power sale, never had a default. Why? Because the default rate for mortgages in this country is less than 0.5%. It's half of 1%. It's very powerful to have a lien on someone's house. It's that simple. And there's two different types of mortgages you can participate in. You can give a mortgage to me on my house, or you could give a mortgage to a builder or a developer who's building a subdivision, or erecting a condo, or building a commercial plaza. But there are no shortage of borrowers, would you agree? Everybody's looking for money. So what we need is a solid process for evaluating them. And I'm telling you, this is becoming the new mutual fund. More and more people are learning about it. It used to be something that was reserved for the wealthy. The wealthy did it, and they didn't talk about it. Why? Because they were making 8 to 12% fixed per year, paid every month, right? Post-dated checks, paid every month. And they were doing it, paying no fees. Like, who has mutual funds? Right? Do you know the average return on a mutual fund in Canada over the last 10 years is under 3%? That's A, under the rate of inflation, and number and B, it's when you talk about fees, we have the highest management fees in the world for mutual funds. You have no, no control over where your money is, no security. Here, you have security. Right? You have a lien on someone's house, super powerful. No fees, fixed returns, 8 to 12, peace of mind, predictability, consistency, all the things you'd want if you don't have the time to manage your own investment portfolio. So if you're somebody who's getting up every day and you're in the stock market, you'll probably make good money because you're doing it every day. If you're giving your money to somebody else, you want to do something like this where it just sits and you make money, right? So that's what we do with RSPs. It's extremely easy to do. You just need guidance. You just need someone to guide you how to do it. Again, it's like this. Uh, now you know how to bank differently to save a lot of money on your mortgage. You build equity at four to five times the normal pace in addition to RSP lending, you could then take equity that's sitting in your house making nothing and lend it to somebody else sitting in their house making something. So we have a lot of people who do that now too. So it's really a matter of just, when you get your eyes open to something new, obviously you need to have a level of trust with the people you're doing it with. That's what we hope to build here. I was saying to Orville before tonight, and we were talking about, <coughs> what's tonight about for us? What's in it for me? Credibility, right? I'm hoping you leave here and you think, these guys, they know, what they're, they're, they know more than most, right? They know what they're talking about. Whether you trust me at the end of tonight or not, maybe you take another step and you're at least willing to talk to me about what's very personal to you. If we've done that much, we're in great shape. Do you know, let me ask you this. Of all the real estate in Canada, what percentage do you think the consumer owns and what percentage do you think the bank owns? So you think, right, when they have a mortgage on your house, if you put 5% down, they own 95% of the house. You want five. So what, what do you think? What do you think is the ratio? So how much of all the real estate in Canada is a bank owned? What percentage does the consumer own? Like 30, 70. 30, 70 in whose favor? In the banks. Bank, bank owns 70. 70. Yeah. Consumer owns 30. How many agree with that? You think it's too high? No, higher. Higher? You think <laughs> yeah, you think 90 the banks own more? Yeah. How much more? 90%. 90%. What do you think, Rob? Did I tell you this already? Yeah. I'd say 90. I'd guess 90, yeah. Oh, man. You ready? This is the moment of moments. Owned by the consumer. Yeah. 
Bank only owns only owns 30 acre close. Just reverse the other one. Bank only owns 33 percent of all the real estate in Canada. Do you know? Can you believe that? Like when I first learned that, I was like, no, 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 no. I got to double check, triple check. Got to see another source that says it. 67 percent of all the real estate is owned by Canada. Now here's the kicker, though. And this is so poignant to what you asked. The bank owns 33 percent of all. The 33 percent. All of it. All of it. Right? How much of this do you think is earning money every day? You know what Canadians do with that? They sit and they hold on to it. And they say, I'm so scared, I spent my whole life building it. And rightly so, no one ever taught them what to do with it, right? So, you can lend it. And there's lots of people willing to borrow it. What you need is somebody you can trust to do the due diligence for you to make sure it's the right circumstances to lend. Here's the beauty, okay? This should make it really easy to understand. There is no shortage of borrowers, which means, in our office, if 10 applications come in today, for money that people want to borrow, and we say no to all 12 or 10, there'll be 10 more tomorrow. It's a luxury, right? Because I can pick and choose. So we lend to about 5% of all the applications we see privately, we lend 5%, okay? We always have more money to lend than we have opportunities to lend, like quality ones. And it's, it's all due to this. This is the system we use. We call it CIA, okay, for a good reason, okay? C is collateral. Here's how it works. It's a really good lesson. I'm so glad you opened this can of worms. Collateral means the property, right? So what's the asset? What do people say about assets? Like, what's the most important thing about picking where your house is? What do people say? They say, location, they say it three location, times. Location, yeah, right. location, location, location. It's the same in lending. We want, here's what we ask ourselves. When somebody comes to us to borrow money, we always say, what's the security? And they say, well, it's my house, and it's down in the beaches, and it's worth a million dollars. We say, okay, great. Let's assume you're not going to pay. So let's start there. Worst case scenario. Let's just assume you're not going to pay. There's a nice legal process in place for us to follow called power of sale, which will force, up, force you to pay by turning over the assets just allowing us to liquidate it, sell it, right? So if we work from that premise, what we have to know is that the asset is in a location that we can get fair market value very quickly if we have to liquidate the property. Because if somebody stops paying you, you want your money back tomorrow, yeah. right? You don't want it back in six months. So to paint the picture for you, when someone comes to us and says, <coughs> uh, come back to this page, they say, uh, I want to borrow 85% of the value of my million dollar property in the beaches. That is more attractive to me then 50%, you would think, right? If they're only borrowing 50% of the value, I have lots of room to sell it and get all my money back, right? I can sell it for less than market value and get all my money back. But 50% on 500,000 for my pickle farm in Grimsby, okay? Okay, because I don't want to own a pickle farm in Grimsby. I don't want to operate a pickle farm in Grimsby or try to sell a pickle farm in Grimsby with me oh, so so location matters type of asset matters right so you know trying to sell uh, trying to sell a condo in a place where there's so many condos there's tons of supply it means I'm just another condo in the middle of a lot of condos so you know in today's time we may not lend privately on condos right now Trump. why not because we don't think that I don't think it's overbuilt at all. I think we're totally fine. By the way, if anybody has any worries, you want to talk to me, I'll give you all the reasons why it's a totally different seminar. But it's all the reasons why we're not going to see a hard bubble in the next three to five years. This is not going to happen. It's going to be a softer landing. We're going to see a correction, I think, but softer. What's going to happen is prices are going to flatline a little bit. Right? They're going to stop appreciating as far as, as fast as they are, and incomes will catch up. Right? But it's not going to nose that. This is not, we don't have the metrics for a nose dive. It's not going to happen. But what you see on the media would have you believe something totally different. Okay, so does that make, that part make sense? Location, the collateral is so important. Well, let me show you what, how we do the math. It's so easy, you can do this yourself. And once we teach you how, you'll want to. So let's say somebody wants to, they have an asset worth $500,000, and they have a first mortgage in place for $350,000. And that's with Scotiabank. And they come to us and they want to, or they want to um, borrow fifty thousand dollars more to put a deck on their backyard. Okay, so this is what they want. They want fifty thousand dollars. And you can do this with your RSPs. You can lend the fifty thousand if you want it. What's amazing is 
All we have to do is the math to determine whether or not in the worst case scenario we feel comfortable that we can get our money back uh, quickly, which we just talked about, location, and that there's enough money to pay everybody involved in the power of sales. Sure. The real estate agent to sell, the lawyer, and so on. It's a really easy thing to do. So let's say worst case happens, we have to sell the property. The first thing we need to do is appraise it. We just have to make sure it's actually worth $500,000. Once we know it's worth 500, we say in the worst case scenario, we're going to have to pay out the first mortgage of 350,000, and we're going to have to sell the property. So when we sell the property, we're going to list it with Orville, and you're going to charge us five percent. No discount. Not even. <laughs> that is discounted. Okay, so 25,000 to Orville. Okay. At both sides, by the way. Orville. Okay. And then we got to pay a lawyer who's got to deal with all this mess, right? So we're going to pay him $10,000. It's not going to cost that much, but you never know with lawyers. So overestimate and be comfortable there. And then we do the math and we add that up. Uh, let's say there's going to be incidentals of fees and whatnot that get tacked on by people when you default. There's fees. So if you, if you tack those on or a little extra fee here and so on, let's just put a, a little extra $10,000 buffer on there. This is the real math we do in the office. 350, 375, 385, 395. Now we got to pay me back. 350, 50,000. So now we're at 445. And we still have 55,000 to spare. So if I said to you, Orville, I want to sell the house like tomorrow, what would you tell me to do to the price of the house? If I wanted to sell the house tomorrow, right. and it's worth 500, yeah. what would you tell me to do? Sell it for Drop the price? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll drop the price by 5%. Yeah. That'll get it sold faster. Yeah. And it's going to be 475 We still have enough money. Yeah. It, it's good. So yeah. it passes that test. That's test number one. Okay? So we got the right location. We got the right math. It all works. Okay? So we move on from there. Yeah? It's not, is it, it's not the second lender that gets to say it's the first lender that gets to say and the first lender is going to say 350 sell it for 350 or sell it for 375 nope, or sell it for it's whatever. not allowed okay so I'm gonna, we're going to address that okay it's, first of all it's not allowed okay we're, we're canadian our rules yeah. are nice they're nice they're nice <laughs> people play nice, okay? yeah, right. the rules are that you have to sell the you have to sell the property in a power sale for fair market value that's right okay so you and the money that's left over that extra 30 grand that goes to the guy who the house the board okay. goes to him. It's his money, right? So it's a liquidation, oh, yeah, but it's okay. not a fire sale, okay? So you just, you don't just get to drop. But five percent, you could, you could, you could drop it by five yeah. percent, and you could argue that that was uh, fair market value, right. okay? Uh, in addition, oh, I don't have thing to say. About it does go to the second mortgage holder. Oh, he'd be registered yeah. against the oh, property. Oh, so you said yeah. uh, it's not the first. It's not the second mortgage uh, mm -hmm. that gets to say that gets to sell it. Yeah. It's the first one because he's in control. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the case. So what happens is when there's a power of sale scenario, if I'm the second mortgagee or mortgagor, sorry, the guy holding the mortgage and you're the first, so you're Scotiabank, yeah. here's what's going to happen. I'm going to call you <coughs> and I say, listen, so there's this default on the property we both have an interest in. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to make the payments on your mortgage keep you current and I'm going to control the power sale and you're going to go great no headache and I get my money first anyways right or you get your money first anyways and you're going to let me control it all it doesn't happen so what you think happens doesn't actually happen what actually happens is Scotia wants nothing to do with this whole thing they just want their money so yes. I'm going to get the money and I'm going to pay I'm going to keep the mortgage current so when we have a lender who's lending money on one of these mortgages we typically tell them to put aside like having a slush fund. Don't lend every dime you have, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Keep some money in case you need to make the mortgage payment on the first one, in the worst case scenario, to keep it current while we get your money back out. Usually the process takes three to five months. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. Then we look at intent to pay. How can you tell if someone has the intent to pay? What could you look at? Their credit credit history or something? Yeah, the credit history. It's really the only thing that can tell us about someone. I mean, you could ask them, and they're probably going to tell you they're great and they have all the intention they want to pay. What we're going to look for is a track record. We're going to look at their credit. We're going to try to determine whether or not it makes sense to lend to this person. There are circumstances where the track record looks bad, but it still makes sense to have them pay. Typically, you find those in a, a separation or a divorce where one, one partner has screwed the other. 
for frankly, right? And the credit is bad, but there's no reason to believe that this person can't pay. That said, if the credit's a mess, we just say no. And we move on to somebody else because there's no shortage of borrowers. Make sense? Actually quite simple. I'm simplifying a little bit more than it is. It takes a little more, longer than uh, what I'm saying. And then ability to pay. Okay, so collateral, intent to pay, and ability to pay. How we're going to determine ability to pay is based on what? Income. You guys can all come work for me tomorrow. <laughs> you all get it. It's, it's, it's common sense, really. Lending to somebody. You know, I used to use this example. I used to say, so now that we know each other a little bit and you feel hopefully comfortable, you know, with me and, you know, we've had a couple last the other one, uh, if I needed to borrow $1,000, how many of you in the room could, if you wanted to, lend me $1,000? Yes? How many would lend me $1,000? That's really nice. There's always one or two. There's always one or two. Now, if I told you that you could hold the keys to my, I have a Cadillac Escalade parked out in front, and you can hold the keys to it uh, until I pay you the thousand dollars back plus the interest we agree on, how many then would lend me the thousand dollars? Yeah, of course. And don't lie to me either. You would all be thinking, I hope he doesn't come back with a thousand bucks and you just keep the car. Yeah? So, right? So, that's what lending is about. It's all about achieving a level of comfort around the security. If you have comfort around the security and the borrower, in fact, to be honest, if you have comfort around the collateral, the borrower doesn't you don't matter. Want, you don't want the intent if the you got the good. It really doesn't matter because you're happy to, it's just a hassle. To go through it. So you do these two things to avoid the hassle. Okay? So we spend a large portion of our day evaluating borrowers, but we're pretty quick to eliminate and sift through to find that sort of top 10 or 5 percent that really makes sense to borrow to. And we borrow those people all day long. And it's just win-win. It's borrower needs money, uh, lender has money, put them together. People often ask the question, who is willing to pay 8 to 12 percent to borrow money? I'm going to show you one example that will bring it to life. And then I will kind of anecdote a few other ones. So here's the example. Somebody wants to buy an $800,000 house. They're self-employed, okay? They have 10% down. They have $80,000. Not like they're deadbeats. They got a lot of money saved up, but they don't have 20% down. Now in today's world, if you don't have 20% down, you've got to pay CMHC insurance, right? And if you're self-employed and you can't verify the income that you have and you need CMHC insurance, the rates are crazy. So, if this was you, and you'd have a mortgage of $720,000, representing 90% of the value of the home you're buying, right? You would be charged 5.45% of 720 in insurance to borrow that money. This insurance would cover the lender in case you default, but you pay for it. And it's added to the mortgage. So five and a half percent of seven twenty, do the math, it's close to forty grand. Yeah. Okay. So your mortgage amount is gonna be close to seven sixty, even though you put eighty down. Okay, and you're gonna pay interest on that, that four five and a half percent over time. So you come to our office and this is your scenario. Now most people they want the house, they fall in love with the house. So and you can tell them this is the truth, right? They'll buy the house. Sure. And they will take this and they will eat it up. And then they come into an office like ours, and I'm going to say, well, before you do that, how long would it take you to pay $80,000 back? Like, you know, you, you make good money, you're doing quite well, uh, how long would it take me? And they say, it would take me two years to save up and pay down $80,000. It's okay. Well, what if I lend you $80,000, okay, in the second position, when you buy the house, and we're going to charge you 12% interest per year on the $80,000, which is $800 a month, right? Okay, $9,600 a year. And then presumably you're going to pay uh, half of it off in the first year. And the second year, you'll still have $40,000 accruing interest at 12%, which would be another $4,800 for a total cost of $14,400. But you won't have to pay this. 15.4. So you say 40, and you pay 14.4. And that's when it makes sense to borrow privately at 12%, because you're paying 12% on this amount, not five and a half on this much more. Are you with me? People don't know this only because they've never been shown. That's it. Because you get it. In three seconds, you get it. Right? It's just never been shown. So there are all kinds of scenarios where it makes sense for people to borrow. 
The misconception is someone borrowing at 8 or 12% is a deadbeat borrower. They're in credit problems, they're a mess, they're high risk. It's yeah, not yeah, the case. Yeah. Since 2009, okay, it used to be like this. The space to borrow at the bank was like this before 2009. So you could fit in. When I started in the business, the first mortgage I wrote was for a stripper who couldn't qualify unless she went and, because um, all cash, right? Everything's cash. She went to the, the ministry, got a master business license, opened up a dance company, okay? Uh, I can't remember her name's dance company, okay? And produced a master business license. The next day, she got a mortgage. That's how easy it was then. It was like this. Then 2009 happened, and it went like this, okay? So the fact is a person like that, like her or not, whether you like what she does for a living, makes great money, paid off half the mortgage very quickly, uh, this person is not high risk. She makes tons of money. She just makes it in a, in a different way, okay? So when the bank did this, it created this space here for private investors that all got in and paid it up because these are still good mortgages. They're still good borrowing scenarios, good lending scenarios. They use their RSPs to do it. They use the equity in their home to do it. They use cash under the mattress to do it. They did all kinds of different things with it, okay? So there are lots of scenarios where private lending makes sense even at 10 or 12%. Um, I'll give you another one quickly off the top of my head. I just met with today a guy uh, by the name of Jeff Reed, good friend of mine, been working with him now for three years. We've been supporting him. He's 25 years flipping homes in the beaches. I mean, he's got it down. And it's six months, he's in, he's out, and he's turning houses over, you know, the old bungalows and tearing them down and putting up nice new modern homes. And they sell, and there's a huge markup on them. But you need financing to do it. So for a guy like that, it's a cost of doing business. Paying 10% on a couple hundred thousand dollars is $20,000, especially if it's gonna make you 200 grand, right? So a guy like him, lend to him all day long. If you ever wanna lend money and I say, uh, I got a deal from Jeff Reed, you just say, okay, put the money there. Because there are guys like that, right? The guys you see on television, same thing. Where do you think they get the money? To do those renovations and whatnot. They're all connected to private money, for sure. Because the banks make it difficult. You gotta jump through hoops and so <coughs> sometimes people borrow at these higher rates just for a path of least resistance, right? It's just easier. And if the numbers work for whatever they're doing with the money, it makes sense, then it works. If you can pay it back in a reasonable period of time, it makes sense. If it takes you five years to pay it back, it starts to get up there. Right? If it takes you 10 years to get up there, you might as well just do this. That's why I asked the question, right? So how much how long does it take to get to pay it back? Okay? So any questions about that or any of that? Who's got the most desserts still left on their table? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Um, FYI, it just goes back to the RSPs. Would you side more on putting your dollars into just some of your discretion you want to put it invest it? Would you put it in RSP or would you put it in your market? I would put it in the mortgage to, to let it sit until there was a good opportunity to lend it and then I would take it out and lend it. So, so That's what you would do. This is what we what do. Would we do. <laughs> what, what we, you're, you're a lender, right? Yeah, what we would do, yeah, I am. So what we would do is, you, first there's a few things, it's such, this is going to be a long-winded answer. So you go from, you're trained to take five-year mortgage deals and you shouldn't, that's good for the bank, but shorter term is better for the consumer. I would say shorter term mortgages, giving you an opportunity to take equity out with no penalty sooner. Build the equity in the mortgage to reduce interest costs day to day. And then when you've saved up enough to fund another mortgage, take it out, lend it to someone else. So let's say for example, you have a current mortgage right now of 220. Okay, because I know these numbers. If you had 220 and you're paying 1193.89, you're good at paying 1193.89. You're okay with it. So if after three years you've built forty thousand dollars in equity, the object of the game actually shouldn't be to get to zero on your mortgage. It should just be a holding cell for equity. So what you're going to do is you've built forty thousand three years later, refinance the mortgage back to 220. Take the forty thousand out. Keep paying eleven ninety three eighty nine, which you're used to anyways, and lend the forty thousand. Let it make you ten or twelve percent a year. So if it's making you ten percent for even numbers, it's making you four thousand dollars a year. This at say five percent is charging you how much per year? It's charging you about ten thousand a year. 
So now you're paying 40% less interest because part of your equity is sitting in someone else's house offsetting your own costs. And over time, you do this. So if you say to me, Chris, I want to do the whole thing, set me up. This is what I'm going to tell you to do. We're going to put you on some sort of a plan to make this happen and be a reality for you. Your money's just going to keep making money. Before you know it, you will have more lent out than you owe on your mortgage. So at any time, you'll be able to pay because you're leveraging the bank's money. You, why wouldn't you take the money? If they're going to give it to you at 3 or 4%, take it all day long and lend it at 12. It's leverage. It's what the bank has been doing to you your whole life. But you don't have to listen to me. <laughs> No, that doesn't factor in the the method interest cancellation, does it? What you just this this quick no. example you just did? It doesn't. Can you do can you do a, the whole yeah, thing I example? Can, or? It'll take too long. Okay. But I can paint you some numbers that, that put that last example into better perspective. Let's say um, let's say you owe let's say you use today's numbers. So let's say you owe three hundred thousand and you're paying three percent interest. So you're paying $9,000 a year, okay? And this will tie into the method, it's just gonna be simpler, okay? So now you come to me and I say, here's what you should do. Let's take $100,000 out of your house. So now let's move your mortgage up to 400,000, okay? And you have $100,000 over here. So you owe 400 and you lend 100. This, you're paying 3% which is 12,000 a year. Yeah. This, you're making 12%, which is 12,000 a year. This is how you create an interest-free mortgage, okay? Now what would happen here is I would say, take the 12,000, you know you're gonna earn from this, borrow it from your line of credit today before you earn it from here, pay it to your mortgage to knock it down, mm -hmm. and use this okay. monthly payment every month to pay down your line of credit. Yeah. Which is also probably charging you four or five percent. <clears throat> it makes sense. Yes. That's how you tie Absolutely. the two together. That's why you fill out your card. Mm -hmm. Okay. It makes sense. Anybody's head about to explode? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just need. We need someone else to dial to. All you need. No, all you need to do is is make one conclusion tonight, and that is, I think Chris knows what he's talking about, or. I don't because we have all the support you would need to execute. Okay? And trust me when I tell you this, okay? I won't ask you to trust me on anything else, but I will trust you. Trust me when I tell you this. The hardest thing about building our business is finding the right people because I care a lot about what because my family and our future depends on serving you guys. So we treat your mortgage like it's our own mortgage. We are not going to be on uh, billboards and buses and so on. We're never going to be a monster company, only because they think we're restricted by how long it'll take me to find enough good people and train them. You can train one, like one a year it takes me. Jeff is the most recent person to join our team. For the first two months, all he did was just come with me every day where I was, everything. Listen to these, talk to people. He just shut up, sit in the corner and just watch. Because you can't learn how to take care of people unless you're watching someone take care of other people. And so we're passionate about that. So if you're confused, you should be confused because it's too much to take in. It took me years to figure this all out and deliver it to you in this way. But if you can conclude as much that, hey, I think this guy knows what he's talking about, then what we do next is we sit down one-on-one -on -one for an hour or two and you invest time with us and we invest time with you. Please don't waste my time. So if, you're not, if it's not serious, don't, don't do it because I wouldn't do it to you but we'll sit down and we'll go through it, your whole picture. I'm actually obligated as a broker of record of, like by Fisco, to know the client that well anyways, because I have to, if I'm gonna recommend something that's suitable to you, I have to understand your situation. So I'm gonna ask you stuff that you're not comfortable sharing. Like what's your SIN number so I can look at your credit situation? What is your income? How do you make money? How, what other investments have you done? What has your experience been? How, what's your risk tolerance? How do you feel about this? What's it gonna feel if I put $50,000 of your money into somebody's mortgage? Are you gonna sleep at night? These are the things I'm obligated to do. I would do them anyways, and I think we do them at a higher level, but we have to. So you're, you're in good shape that way, okay? But that's the only promise I can make, is that if you think you conclude that every, everything here makes sense, and you, you're, it's better than maybe what you're doing in the past. Maybe you know this is a better way to get more out of your RSPs than what you've done in the past. Then we just talk and we figure out what makes sense for you today, and then we revisit it every year. 
I'll figure it out. So we are in a way invest investment advisors at the same time as we are mortgage planners. But you can do a lot with mortgages. It's uh, great uh, if you know how to manage your own and know how to lend to others. Really powerful and simple. Once you start doing it, it's quite easy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How do you make your money? Do you hold mortgages or Ooh. what? Correct. Right. I probably should have touched on that earlier. So we make money two ways. When we borrow money for you with an institution, so when we connect you with a bank, and we're connected to about 50 of them, we really only deal with about 11. Like I have 11 relationships I can call somebody on the phone and talk to that person and get really good results for you. And I don't really have to go outside of those 11 in order to satisfy any type of scenario. Um, so we charge, uh, we charge a finder's fee, like a referral fee, to the bank we place the mortgage with. And they all, it's just the way it is. Okay, it works out to about 75 basis points. So it's about 75% of 1% of the money that you borrow. So if your mortgage is 300,000, it's gonna be, I think, 2250. So what the brokerage makes, then we pay our staff. If you lend money with us, we charge the borrower a fee to have found them the money that they needed. Does that make sense? So you, as a customer of ours, never pay us, and your money never flows through our hands. So if we arrange a mortgage for you to fund as a lender, the money goes from you to a lawyer in trust, to the borrower, back to a lawyer, back to you. And if you borrow money, if you do your mortgage through us, then obviously the bank, you deal directly with the bank, and you get the money. So no money into our hands, and that's our, it's a very simple fee structure. Charge the borrower fee for lending, and we charge the bank a fee for borrowing for on your behalf. Anything else? Was it worth it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you guys should eat. You guys should eat. I'm going to stick around for a little while. Um, you can uh, ask your questions if you have them. Uh, if you're done and you want to go, by all means, go. If you want to have another drink, have another drink. I don't think we're under any time constraint, right? No. So we're good? No. Guys, thank you. I got to tell you, um, when I say thank you to you, what I'm thanking you for is not being here so that I can solicit you to be a client of ours, although that is exactly what I'd like to do. I'm thanking you because this is the place I enjoy being the most. So at the end of a long day, I get to do this once a week, once every couple of weeks. I, I love it. It's like a release for me, so I enjoy it. And I can't do it without an audience. It's really tough. I've talked to you all many times, but it's not as enjoyable as talking to you guys. So I appreciate it. So thank you. Okay.